Hello, my name is David Swinton. I'm one of the neuroradiologists at Leicester Royal Infirmary, and I'm going to be talking to you about computed tomography, which really is one of the cornerstones of modern imaging. By way of outline, I'm going to start with a little bit of history, but move on to the modern CT scanner. I'm going to cover some of the basics, so how we start with an X-ray being sent through the patient to a detector, how that's processed and turned into a picture that is useful that you can see. I'm going to look at some common uses for CT scanning and then cover some of the advantages and disadvantages of CT scanning. And I'd hope that some of the advantages will become apparent as I go through some of the clinical uses. So I'll start by defining terms and I apologise, this is one of the few slides with just words on it, but tomography is the process for generating a two dimensional image or slice of a three dimensional object. And in this case, that is a, a, of a patient. And I would have thought the computing part is self evident, but computers control the delivery of x-rays, the movement of the scanner. It helps process the detector data and does the complicated calculations involved in producing an image from those data. CT has been in clinical use since 1971 and in terms of the advance in medicine and surgery it really is comparable to the discovery of x-rays by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. It's unsurprising that the man who's generally credited with the invention, pictured here, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1979 for his role in its invention. The first clinical scan took place on the 1st of October 1971 at Atkinson Morley Hospital in London. The patient had a suspected frontal lobe tumour and the scan, which you can see here, produced an 80 by 80 pixel picture. It took about five minutes to produce each slice and a similar time to actually put that data together to produce a picture. Polaroid uh, photographs of the scan output had to be then taken and given to the clinicians as a sort of early pack system. The first scanner was just for scanning heads, but scanners for the rest of the body soon followed. The scan shown here shows a cystic lesion and the surgeon performing the scan said it looked just like the picture. Here's a photograph of the EMI Mark I, which was the, uh, the scanner introduced in North America. And you can see that many of the components present in the first scanners uh, are obviously present and have survived uh, to the current day. You can see you have the couch where the patient lies and the aperture here for the patient's head. Uh, and obviously that became bigger as larger parts of the body were scanned. And this whole square gantry would rotate around the patient. And behind the scanner, you can see the support equipment needed to not only supply the X-ray tube with uh, high voltage, but also to take the information back and start the data processing. And here is a modern uh, scanner. This is a 128 slice uh, GE scanner. And you can see that although it's a lot more modern looking, a lot shinier and cleaner, it re retains many of the original features. So you can see you have the couch where the patient lies, a little cradle here for their head. You have the aperture. Um, and what you also see uh, in this, as well as lots of the, uh, the mess and paraphernalia that goes with uh, clinical scanning, is the pump injector for contrast, which is a substance which contains iodine, which is injected into the patient at the time of scanning, which is used to enhance some, some scans. Inside the scanner is clearly a, a much more complicated business, and there's a lot going on here, but I want to draw your attention to a couple of components. At the top, you have the X-ray source or tube, and this has lots of equipment to support it, to help cool it down, to supply it with a very high voltage. But essentially, X-rays are produced here. They travel in a straight line through the centre of the scanner, where this spirit level is. This is obviously a scanner undergoing maintenance to this array of detectors and what is called the data acquisition system where the first stages of uh, image production occur. This whole gantry spins around the patient at a very high speed. The scanner I showed you, the modern scanner, is capable of spinning around at nearly three times per second uh, 
Uh, I encourage you to go onto YouTube and look for uh, pictures of scanners with the covers off being uh, taken up to full speed. So how do we go from there to an actual image formation? It's said that Godfrey Hounsfield initially thought about the problem of CT scanning as having a black box, the contents of which were unknown, but you wanted to know the contents of. So what can we do? Well, in the case of CT scanning, we start with an X-ray source and we shine these X-rays through the black box. They go into the black box, but only some come out. And when they do come out, they are changed or uh, attenuated. And that means some are absorbed and some are scattered away. This word attenuation, it really means the reduction in the magnitude or amplitude or intensity of the X-rays. And again, that's secondary to either the uh, X-rays being absorbed by whatever's in the box or being scattered away, bounced away and not reaching the detectors. So how do we use that information? Well, we don't just take one picture, as it were, of the object we're scanning. We take several and as the tube moves around the patient or the object we're scanning, uh, we take several pictures, each of which is called a projection. And you can see from this sequence of pictures that the more projections we take, the more exposures we make of the tube moving around the patient, the better the picture is we have uh, in approximating what the original object was, which is in this case is a, a sphere sort of floating in space. You can see with this uh, uh, slightly more complicated object um, that again, the more uh, projections you have, the, the better or more true the image you have is of a representation of what was originally in the scanner. You might also appreciate from these pictures there's a little bit more to it. There's a lot more processing involved in sharpening up and fine tuning that image uh, to give a good uh, approximation of what was originally inside the scanner. So in terms of forming the image, hundreds of thousands of samples are taken for a scan, thousands per rotation. And the same part of a patient contributes to several projections. I should say at this point that all modern scanners scan the patient in a single continuous movement. The patient is driven through the scanner on that couch. It's no longer right to talk about a scanner requiring a, a slice at a time. The whole patient is scanned and those slices are produced later um, by the computer. We've scanned the patient several times and you can then calculate the attenuation or how much uh, the x-rays are stopped by each little part of the patient and that can be calculated. And so imagine now the patient is made up of millions of tiny cubes, tiny boxes that we want to know the, uh, the contents of. We'll call these voxels or volume elements. And so by using all those projections, we know how much the tissue in each of those small boxes blocks or attenuates x-rays. And we can give a value to that level of attenuation or how much the, uh, that cube blocks x-rays. And that can be represented in two dimensions with a pixel. By convention, we say that any substance that doesn't attenuate x-rays very much has a low value and substances which really block or even stop x-rays completely has a very, very high value. These values or Hounsfield units uh, typically range from the minus thousands to the plus thousands. And it's when you look at a picture like this, which is a section through an abdomen, you can see that how bright or dark the pixels are in this picture depends on what the x-ray has passed through. And if we break it down a little bit, uh, we can see that the different values help us delineate anatomy. So if we look at what's dark on a CT, so these are substances that don't particularly block uh, x-rays compared to uh, the rest of what's in the imaged field. So the air around the body. We've also got some gas in the bowel here. And again, that's very dark. On the other side, we've got things that are very bright. So we've got contrast, which is this uh, substance we inject into some patients before scanning, which contains iodine. And that's very bright. Here it is in the aorta. We also have bone. Bone uh, is very attenuating and shows up very bright on CT, and um, particularly the cortical bone here, you've got a vertebral body. 
Uh, also metal, metal will also show up very bright uh, on CT, not present in this patient, but either a result of an accident or contact with medical professionals, you may have metal within your body. And again, that, that will show up very well. And in fact, can be so attenuating that it can cause um, problems with the scanner in terms of um, blocking other parts of the image. And we've got some attenuations that are in the middle. So we've got the paraspinal muscles here, sort of a middle gray color and the fat, which is darker than the muscle, but not as dark as the surrounding um, air or gas within the bowel. CT has innumerable uses within medicine and surgery. Um, by way of demonstrating that, UHL performed around 43,000 CTs in 2019 for the A&E uh, and inpatients alone. That's just short of uh, 118 per day. And if that sounds like a lot, it is. That's a scan every 12 minutes and 13 seconds. Um, it has key roles acutely, and I'm going to concentrate on those giving some examples of how useful CT is. Um, CT head, CT of the cervical spine, a particular kind of chest CT called the CT pulmonary angiogram, the so-called CTKUB, kidneys, ureters and bladder, looking for kidney stones, and then the CT abdomen and pelvis. So here is a CT head scan, uh, and one of the major indications for a, a CT head is in the context of trauma and around half of the scans uh, that we do for A&E uh, are CT heads. And the reason it's so useful is that acute blood will show up as bright, which on the background of the rest of the brain uh, shows up very well. So you can see the rest of the brain has a little bit of variation, but it's a sort of middling gray color. And here you can see this extradural or epidural hematoma, which is very bright and easy to see. So CT is, is very good at picking up blood. Keeping with the indication for trauma, CT is very good at looking at bony detail, and in this case, a fracture. The same scan data are used, but they're treated slightly differently when the, the images are reconstructed, and it just sharpens up the image. And you can see here, there's a fracture, which can be differentiated from the two sutures or joins in the skull bones either side which are very symmetrical. I've just zoomed in here and you really do get a feeling uh, on this picture how sensitive CT is to fractures. This is an incredibly small structure, this hairline fracture in the bone, but nevertheless CT with a bone reconstruction can resolve that quite easily. Moving on to stroke, which again forms about 30% of the, the scans we do in ED. Um, this is a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, typically associated with hypertension, centered on the basal ganglia. We can see the bleed. As I said, blood shows up very well on CT, but we can also assess for complications. So here you can see blood has extended into the ventricular system. Uh, this patient will be at risk of hydrocephalus. That isn't shown here, but the ventricular dimensions, very easy to see on CT. And I think the real strength of CT, particularly in stroke imaging, is it helps direct treatment quickly. You get a very quick and real time decision uh, with the aid of CT. Sticking with stroke, again, this is an ischemic stroke, uh, which is demonstrated as this low region of attenuation uh, in the frontal lobe. CT in the context of ischemic stroke can be normally initially, but as time goes on, the region of infarcted tissue gets darker and darker compared to the normal brain. CT can also not only demonstrate the infarct itself, it can also help demonstrate complications. So you can see the large infarct here in this younger patient. And what has happened is the mass effect from this infarct has effaced or just squashed the lateral ventricle on this side and you can see that some of these midline structures have been pushed to the other side so there's midline shift and this patient is one who potentially the treating clinicians would want to seek the opinion of a neurosurgeon. In terms of cervical spine imaging the, the main acute indication would be trauma and as I've mentioned already CT is very good at looking at bony detail and, and fracture uh, here is a fracture of the odontoid peg or dens uh, 
and with most fractures occurring at the top or the bottom of the cervical spine CT is very good uh, at these regions which can be difficult to image on a plain x-ray the uh, a decent set of c-spine x-rays can be difficult to obtain in a patient who are immobilized and at the top uh, the top end of the spine where i said a large proportion of fractures occur you can get false positives and false negatives and it can be really difficult to image the lower cervical spine on x-rays particularly with the patient's shoulders and if they're unwell or immobilized ct is really good uh, at imaging the cervical spine you get a, a lovely view of the whole spine Moving on to uh, CT pulmonary angiogram or CTPA as it's ubiquitously known, there are many indications for a CT of the chest, but acutely uh, CTPA uh, plays a large role. It's a good test to look for clots within the pulmonary arteries. What we have here is a CT of the chest and we've given contrast and we scanned at a particular time when the pulmonary artery, which is this structure, uh, is nicely opacified and full of contrast and what you see are these dark blobs within the pulmonary artery and essentially these are what we call filling defects so these are regions where the blood full of contrast isn't able to flow and that shows that there are clots and ctpa is a really good test for picking up even very small clots in the lungs it can also demonstrate you know complications uh, within the lungs such as uh, pulmonary infarct and even suggest if there might be a degree of right heart strain Moving further down the body, uh, the CTKUB uh, for looking at renal calculi. And the strength of this investigation is that almost all stones uh, are high attenuation and will show up as bright objects which will stand out against the rest of the, uh, the viscera. This scan uh, doesn't involve any contrast and you can see that the muscles, the kidney, the soft tissues and the uh, the intestines are all very similar in attenuation but what sticks out like a sore thumb is this kidney stone the other advantage is ct won't just demonstrate the stone it may demonstrate some surrounding uh, surrounding findings and complications like a hydroureter or hydronephrosis moving on finally to the use of ct uh, and the acute abdomen there are many causes of an acute abdomen and CT has many roles in many surgical pathways and is, is really key in surgical triage. I've, show, I've got an example here of a duodenal ulcer and CT can demonstrate the, uh, the primary abnormality. So the second part of the duodenum is very irregular and thickened and there's fluid and there's what's called stranding surrounding it, suggesting there's inflammation. You can see the fat surrounding this, this part of the duodenum is not like the rest of the fat, the subcutaneous fat or the, uh, the intra-abdominal fat. Uh, so CT can demonstrate the, the primary abnormality. And it can also demonstrate the complications. So in this case, there is some free fluid within the abdomen, which is abnormal. And you've got some free gas here, which has floated up to the top of the abdomen. You have to remember this is a patient lying, uh, lying on their back. So this is the top. And so CT can demonstrate that the, the primary abnormality here is a duodenal ulcer and it, it is complicated by perforation. So hopefully those indications will show you that CT is an incredibly powerful and useful tool and um, particularly in acute medicine, but it, its use is not to be underestimated, particularly um, a host of outpatient and uh, elective uses and certainly in terms of uh, cancer diagnosis and follow-up CT is incredibly important. Its main advantages are it is fast, it takes seconds to actually perform the scan, it takes longer to get the patient to the scanner on and off the table and so forth and for that reason it's very well tolerated so even a very unwell patient will be able to lie still for a few seconds required for the scan. It's readily available, it's in all hospitals, and it's accessible. Large room, you haven't have, don't have to worry about things like large magnetic fields and totally taking the right equipment in there. Patients can go in there, even very unwell uh, patients with lots of equipment, be scanned very quickly and come out again. The images are clear and available instantly. 
So some radiological investigations may generate um, pictures that are not particularly uh, intuitive to look at, but CT is innately anatomical and clinicians are able to view their own images and make decisions, as I say, in real time. And those pictures are available straight away. And you'll come to realise that CT, and in fact all imaging, plays you know, a key role in both the diagnosis uh, and treatment uh, of many conditions. Of course, it's very rare in life you get something for nothing. The, the main drawback of CT is that uh, it involves exposing a patient to ionising radiation, and the concern is obviously inducing cancer. Of course, this all has to be placed into the uh, balance of risk and benefit. And if you have an incredibly unwell person, you know, the, the risk of a, a future cancer is, uh, is outweighed by actually uh, the ability to make a rapid diagnostic decision and treat the, the much more life threatening and immediate condition. This table just shows, though, the relative amount of exposure uh, required for a CT investigation compared to a chest X-ray, which has been normalised as one and that equates to about two and a half days background radiation. So that's the normal radiation you're exposed to just living in Leicester for two and a half days. And I put on some common CT investigations. So moving from the lowest, relatively low uh, dose investigation, a CT head, has the equivalent radiation of about 90 chest X-rays or seven and a half months of background radiation. Of course, that's being delivered in a few seconds. However, you'll see as we move up and we image more of the body and include more radiosensitive parts of the body, um, you rapidly get to incredibly large numbers of uh, chest X-rays and a CT chest, abdomen and pelvis uh, will involve a, a dose equivalent to several hundreds of uh, chest X-rays. While the absolute numbers are not, as not important, it's really just the idea that CT is a real heavy hitter in terms of dose and a, a you know CT abdomen and pelvis you're looking at hundreds of chest x-rays in terms of radiation exposure. Another uh, potential risk of CT is the the contrast we give uh, may uh, cause kidney damage or worse than existing kidney damage um, and the people who are particularly uh, prone to that are people with pre-existing poor kidney function, um, you know, people who are maybe taking certain medications such as metformin, um, or people who have acutely uh, low uh, renal function, secondary to things like hypovolemia. Um, however, quite often the risk of uh, causing kidney damage is outweighed by the need to make an immediate uh, and potentially life-saving diagnosis. So hopefully I've covered CT for you in terms of some of the basics and how we go from an x-ray to a picture and I've covered some of the advantages and disadvantages. The main disadvantage being it's a relatively high dose investigation but you'll see it's an incredibly powerful investigation with many key uses in modern medicine and surgery. Thank you very much.